Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namah Bhagavate Vasudevaya Janmadasya Yato Niveyad Itaratas Chartesu Avigya Swarat Janmadasya Yatam Vanyad Itaratas Chartesu Avigya Swarat Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tejo Varimidam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisargo Mesha Tejo Varimida Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisargo Mesha Damna Svena Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimayi Damna Svena Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimayi O my Lord Sri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva O my Lord Sri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva O all-pervading personality of Godhead I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes, of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He, he is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he's independent because there's no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations, of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitrovo tra paramo nirmatsaranam satam Vedyam vastavam atra vastu. Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shimad bhagavate mahamuni krite. Kim va purer ishwaraha. Sadyo hridi avarudyate tra. Kriti bihi susu subhistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such, root, such truth uproots the threefold mysteries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, By this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam falam. Sukamakad amrita travya samyutam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Muhur ahorasika buvibhavakaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. 
the mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sugadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Even though its nectarine juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hedyantaksto Abhadrani Vidunati Srihitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nastaprayesu Bhadresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistaki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajastamo bhavo Kamaloba dayaschaye Cheta etarana vidam Stitvam satve prasidati By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso Bhagavat bhakti yogataha Bhagavat tattva vijnana Mukta sangasya jayate when these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Sarva samsaya, shiyante chasya karmani, drista evatmanishwari. Thus bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram, understanding the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 13, Text Number 51. Dhritarashtra Sahabharta. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Text number 54. Chita Sano Chita Svasa Pratyatra Sad Indriya Hari Bhavanaya Dvasta Raja Sattva Tamo Mala Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, 
A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. One who has controlled the sitting postures, the yoga as yogic asanas, and the breathing process can turn the senses toward the absolute personality of Godhead and thus become immune to the contamination of the modes of material nature, namely mundane goodness, passion, and ignorance. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The preliminary activities of the way of yoga are asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dhyana, dharana, and samadhi. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, I, just, no, I forgot one. Asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dhyana, dharana. What? I'll oh, say yama, niyama, asana, yeah, okay, and samadhi. Maharaj Chitarashtra was to attain success in those preliminary actions because he was seated in a sanctified place <clears throat> and was concentrating upon one objective, namely the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari. Thus, all his senses were being engaged in the service of the Lord. This process directly helps the devotee to get freedom from the contaminations of the three modes of nature. Oh, so there's an interesting point here. Is there a difference between what Maharaj Dhritarashtra did and what modern yogis are doing? Is there a difference? What's the difference? Yeah, and what are the modern yogis focused on? The third eye, uh, I don't know, on Babaji or some <laughs> some nonsense stuff. They're not they're not focused on the supreme personality God. Even the highest mode, the material mode of goodness, is also a cause of material bondage. Now, this is something most people would argue about. And so, oh, how can you say that? You know, I know people who are not Krishna conscious, but they're better people than the Krishna conscious people. They'll start talking all kinds of nonsense like that. <clears throat> Even the highest mode, mode of, the material mode of goodness, is also a cause of material bondage. And what to speak of other qualities, namely passion and ignorance. Passion and ignorance increase the material propensities of hankering for material enjoyment. Now, this is a very interesting point because this is the real subject that's taught in public schools. In fact, uh, one of the kids wrote their homework today for today. And she said that in school, all kind the four regulative principles are being broken in the school, not you know outside in a park or at home. In the school itself, the four regulative principles are being broken. And then she went through a list of the four things that are being broken, and, and uh, so this is what they teach. This is the real subject that they're teaching in public school: how to break the four regulative principles. And then she goes and then she actually explains things that teachers tell them to help the kids break the principles. Now we won't go over it now. If you want to hear that, come to the class uh, at around 9 o'clock today. But she is giving a live testimony. And then her sister wrote, who's in the... Uh, the lower classes, she said, well, I, I like going to school, but they break three principles. <laughs> well, because they're just a little bit younger still, right? And, uh, and, uh, but, and she said, I like it, except I don't like these three principles, right? But her sister is in the older classes. She said, the four principles are broken. 
Compassion and ignorance increase the material propensities of hankering for material enjoyment and a strong sense of lust provokes the accumulation of wealth and power. There you go. That explains Bezos and the others, right? One who has conquered these two base mentalities, passion and ignorance, and has raised himself to the platform of goodness, which is full of knowledge and morality, cannot also control the senses, namely the eyes, tongue, the nose, ear, and touch. Wow, now that's an amazing statement right there. Let's read that again. One who has conquered these two base mentalities, that is, passion and ignorance, and has raised himself to the platform of goodness, Sattva Guna, which is full of knowledge and morality, cannot, cannot, that's the key word, also control the senses, namely the eyes, the tongue, the nose, the ear, and the touch. But one who has surrendered himself unto the lotus tree of Lord Hari, as above mentioned, can transcend all the influences of the modes of material nature and be fixed in the service of the Lord. So here we see a difference between someone who is in the mode of goodness, but the mundane mode of goodness, and who has over, overcome the influence of ignorance and passion, or lust and avarice. But they still can't control the five senses and the mind. The Bhakti Yoga process therefore directly applies the senses to the loving service of the Lord. So that's the difference right there. The loving service of the Lord. Not just the performance of rituals. <coughs> not just <coughs> meditation on the third eye or whatever. This prohibits the performer from engaging in material activities. In other words, until we actually apply all our senses, including the mind, in the loving service of the Lord, uh, we, we can't get our mind off of sense gratification. This process of turning the senses from material attachment to the loving transcendental service of the Lord is called pratyahara, and the very process, and the very process is called pranayama, ultimately ending in samadhi or absorption, in pleasing the supreme Lord Hari by all means. So here's a, another major difference between what they're teaching in yoga classes and what should be taught. This pranayama, these breathing exercises, is not for health, and it's not for. Uh, <clears throat> attaining liberation but it's for fixing the mind completely on Krishna through loving devotional service <clears throat> okay so there are many points here uh, but the main point is that if a person doesn't come to loving devotional service of the Lord through bhakti yoga through then they have not really understood Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, and they have not really uh, conquered the subtle mind and senses uh, and directed them completely to the devotional service of the Lord. So therefore, Krishna says, Bhaktiya Tvananyaya Saka Aham Evam Vidurjana Gyatam Jostam Chitatvena Pravestam Cha Parantapa. 11th chapter, 54th verse, which says, My dear Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. And in the purport, Prabhupada says, Krishna can be understood only by the process of undivided devotional service. He explicitly explains this in this verse, 
so that unauthorized commentators who try to understand Bhagavad Gita by the speculative process will know that they are simply wasting their time. No one can understand Krishna or how he came from parents in a four-handed form and at once changed himself into a two-handed form. These things are very difficult to understand by study of the Vedas or by philosophical speculation. Therefore, it is clearly stated here that no one can see him or enter into understanding of these matters. Those who, however, are very experienced students of Vedic literature can learn about him from the Vedic literature in so many ways. So here we see why public education not only is misleading, but it guarantees in most cases that one will never understand Krishna. Guarantees. And in most cases, there, are, there may be some exceptions, but in most cases. Why is that? Because they never emphasize loving devotional service to the Lord. Is there any class how to uh, attain pure devotional service? No. They're talking about, you know, black lives matter. No justice, no peace. A bunch of nonsense. See, that's why when Prabhupada said to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, well, you know, uh, how can we, a, a conquered nation, a subjected nation to British colonialism, preach the message of, of, of Lord Chaitanya? And Bhakti Siddhanta said, look, these politics will go on forever. They're unending. You think you have the solution and you uh, overthrow one government, replace it with another government, but it's the same thing. It's all misleading. It's all about sense gratification. Therefore, just engage in devotional service. Don't waste your time with politics and other uh, such diversions that lead to nowhere. It's like a bridge that goes to nowhere. Sometimes uh, congressional representatives are able to convince Congress to spend uh, $100 million to build a bridge in Alaska. But where does the bridge go? It goes from the mainland to an island where nobody lives. <laughs> so that's called a bridge to nowhere, right? But he got the money from the Congress and by lobbying and this thing and that thing. But it goes nowhere. It goes to an island where nobody lives. So, but it created some jobs and uh, he can come back home and say, well, I built that bridge to this island, uh, uh, but it goes nowhere. So that is what material knowledge is all about. It goes, it goes nowhere. It just takes you back to where you started from. Birth, death, old age, and disease. <clears throat> Those who, however, are very experienced students of Vedic literature can learn about him from the Vedic literature in so many ways. There are so many rules and regulations. And if one at all wants to understand Krishna, he must follow the regulative principles described in the authoritative literature. Now, Prabhupada started the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Well, there's another joker a, a different person who claims to be a guru, started the International Society for Divine Love. Right. And what, did, what was he teaching? He said, you don't have to follow sadhana bhakti. I'll give you raga bhakti right away. You see. So all the people who have a cheating propensity, they go there. You don't have to follow the rules and regulations of sadhana bhakti. He'll give you, because the goal is raga bhakti, therefore I'll give you raga bhakti right away. Let's see. Right away, uh, this person who was born in India, this so-called guru, he, he's dead now. But his nonsense is continuing. And he wrote a book about Lord Chaitanya. And he wrote a book on the six astakam. Right? And... <laughs> <laughs> He's teaching people Raga Bhakti right away. And 
the most prominent people in, in this movement are women. Women sannyasis, you see. It's a complete deviation from the six Goswamis and from Lord Chaitanya also. So this is all types of cheating that is going on today in Kali Yuga. And most of it comes from India. India is the land of cheating. And so many nonsense people. Like, for example, if you go on Indian television and you say, well, the real incarnation of Krishna, please stand up. How many people do you think would stand up in India? Hundreds, thousands would stand up. They all look at each other. Wait, well, how come you're standing? I'm the, I'm the real one. Well, wait a minute. I'll say if you're the real one, if you say I'm the real one. Okay, now we, we have a pact here. We have a deal. But that's what they do. They all validate each other as false prophets or false uh, incarnations of the Lord. <clears throat> one can per perform penance in accordance with those principles. For example, to undergo serious penances, one may observe fasting on Janmashtami, the day on which Krishna appeared. And on the two days of Ekadasi, the 11th day after the new moon and the 11th day after the full moon. So what is the difference between penance and austerity? There is a difference. Sometimes those words are used uh, interchangeably, but there, there is a difference in meaning. So penance is... A, some kind of austerity you do to make up for sinful activity. And austerity is willful denial of the senses, not necessarily because you did anything wrong, but because you want to use the senses only in Krishna's service. So the Mayavadis, they will deny the use of the senses, and the devotees only use the senses in the service of Krishna. <coughs> so, uh, most people will perform penance because they've committed sinful activities, they know it, and they want to make up for it. They want to, they want to diminish the karmic debt. But yogis, real yogis, will engage in austerities, uh, but not to, the, the real yogis, not to dis deny the senses, but only use them in the service of Krishna. Whereas the Mayavadis, they'll deny the use of the senses. So therefore they have incomplete renunciation. Because when something can be used in a Krishna's service and you don't use it in Krishna's service, that's incomplete falgu vairagyam, incomplete renunciation. So the senses can be used in Krishna's service. So why uh, refuse to use them? That's the that's the dilemma of the Mayavadi philosophers and, and yogis. As far as charity is concerned, it is plain that charity should be given to the devotees of Krishna who are engaged in his devotional service to spread the Krishna philosophy or Krishna consciousness throughout the world. Krishna consciousness is a benediction to humanity. Lord Chaitanya was appreciated by Rupa Goswami as the most munificent man of charity because love of Krishna which is very difficult to achieve, was distributed freely by him. So you want to be most merciful and munificent or charitable, then develop love of Krishna yourself and then teach others. That's the greatest charity. I remember one time in a class, Prabhupada asked uh, a, a devotee who was like the leader in Paris, he asked him to uh, give a class. So he was giving a class. Prabhupada was sitting on the Vyasa and listening. And at one point he said, and we're not engaged in mundane charity. We're not, we're not engaged in any kind of charity work because, you know, we, we have the highest truth. And Prabhupada stopped him. He said, that is not correct. He said, Krishna consciousness is the best charity work. <laughs> so it's very easy for us to go off track, uh, but Prabhupada is there to correct us. That's why we should listen to Prabhupada's purports every day so we don't go off 
the rails. There are two parallel rails, Guru and Krishna. So when you have properly made train tracks, the rails are parallel. So the, a train that goes on those parallel rails never derails. But if they make some mistake, and there's one point where the, they're not exactly parallel, the, the train will go off the tracks. Okay. So the parallel rails are Prabhupada and Krishna. That's what we should rely on for all our knowledge and all our understandings. So, if one gives some amount of his money to persons involved in distributing Krishna consciousness, that charity given to spread Krishna consciousness is the greatest charity in the world. So, we're going to begin to collect money for to, to finish our temple in, uh, in uh, Bellevue. We're going to use that quote in the, in the video and the magazine that we have. So if one gives some amount of his money to persons involved in distributing Krishna consciousness, that charity given to spread Krishna consciousness is the greatest charity in the world. And if one worships as prescribed in the temple, in the temples in India, there is always some statue, usually of Vishnu or Krishna. That is a chance to progress by offering worship and respect to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> Notice he didn't use, use the word idol. He said a statue. Right. For the beginners in devotional service to the Lord, temple worship is essential. And this is confirmed in the Vedic literature, Svetasvastara Upanishad 6.23. Yasya Devi Parao Bhakti Yata Devi Tatak Guru one who has unflinching devotion for the Supreme Lord and is directed by the spiritual master in whom he has similar unflinching faith can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead by revelation. So this is an extremely important point. Krishna consciousness is not an academic process. It's based on revelation. And Krishna, as he says, Yetamam Papadyante Tamstatava Bajam Yaham Mamavart Manavartante Manishya Partasarvasaha. As one surrenders unto him, he progressively or he proportionately reveals himself to the devotee. In any case, everyone follows his path. So by surrendering to Krishna, Krishna reveals knowledge to the devotee. Istvara Sarvabhutanam Hirde Se Rajunatistati. So the Supreme Lord is present in the heart of everyone. Sarvashicham Hirdi Sanivisto Mataksmati Gyana Mapahanam Cha and from him come knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So if if we engage in nonsense then Krishna helps us forget him. Because you can't engage in nonsense unless you forget Krishna. So, he helps us forget him. But if you are sincere about hearing and chanting and, and engaging in devotional service, then Krishna reveals himself progressively or proportionately to the degree one surrenders to him. So this is revelation theology. It's not academic theology. One cannot understand Krishna by mental speculation. For one who does not take personal training under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, it is impossible to even begin to understand Krishna. The word too is specifically used here to indicate that no other process can be used, can be recommended, or can be successful in understanding Krishna. Haribo, Ogois, the Sheila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Jai. Are there any questions? Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, I would like to clarify when that devotee was giving class, said, would not engage in mundane charity. So He didn't say mundane, he said charity. Oh, he said charity, okay. Yeah. Because it 
could have, it could have been right by saying mundane charity. Yeah, yeah. he said charity. In general, okay. Yeah, that's why Prabhupada stopped him. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I would like, if you could elaborate on the, what is undivided devotion? Well, this is a good question. Undivided devotion means, let's say you are a an aviation uh, expert and you work in the airport in the uh, control room where you're helping planes fly in and land properly. Can you be like, you know, listening to, watching television while you're doing that or or talking on the cell phone to some girlfriend? Or <laughs> no, because even a few minutes or a few seconds in attention could cause the crash of the airplane, right? So you have to be fully attentive to help the airplane land safely, you help the pilot, you know, land safely. So that's what... It means by undivided attention. You, you can't take your mind off of Krishna. It, anything that deviates your mind from uh, devotional service and, and, and meditating on the details of the devotional service. So in other words, a devotee always wants to make service better. But that requires undivided attention. Right? If you... If you say, oh, yeah, I can't wait till it's over. I'm getting tired of doing the same thing every day. You know, and it's, your mind starts going away and looking at other ways of uh, entertaining yourself rather than devotional service. But if you're only meditating on pleasing Krishna and you want to make it better and better all the time, then you have to have undivided attention. Right? Okay, any other questions? Uh, yes. Just one point. Yeah. Um, it's okay for the devotees who have a tendency to, it's natural for someone to, to be curious, trying to know what's going on around. But the devotees are sometimes uh, reading articles to know about what's going on in the world. But it's uh, as good as, because usually we say we shouldn't uh, pay attention to mundane, mundane, uh, news or something like that. But for the boy who's curious wants to know what's going on in the underworld, but at the moment, for instance, so many things going on politically and uh, health-wise or something. Is that okay for the body to try to understand? Well, it depends why you're looking at the news. Right. Are you looking at the news just to make sure you don't lead a San Quentin party into a dangerous situation? Right. Like, for example, uh, there was this uh, lady devotee who was made a sannyasi. And she was preaching in Liberia while there was a revolution going on. I think it was Liberia. Yeah. While there was a revolution going on there, right? Yeah. And then one day in a public meeting where she was preaching, the leader of one of the revolutionary groups came there to listen to what she was saying. And she was preaching, she was saying, yo, and, uh, and people getting in, involved in the revolution, they should put down their guns. Right. What did he do? He went back, ordered his soldiers to go and kill her and all the people that were with her. They came with their machine guns and the machine gun, she, she was killed. So, <laughs> you gotta be careful what you say, right? Because if a leader says something that puts not only the leader but the followers into danger and, and risk of death, that's not a good thing. So they have to be aware. So maybe she wasn't aware or maybe she was aware. That, that would make it even worse that this revolutionary leader, commander, came to hear her lecture. I said, and she did. She, I think, I'm pretty sure she did know. So that is a very bad thing. 
And the result was that she was murdered and so were some other devotees. So it's good to know uh, what's going on in order to protect your people and uh, the people under you and and uh, so that the Sankirtan movement can continue. To adjust uh, strategies. Yes. Exactly. Otherwise... That was Mother, Lad Mother Ladini. Huh? Dan Madhiji. Yeah. Ladini. Oh, Ladini. Okay, you know, you know about her, right? Story, yeah. Is it correct what I said? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, some people will argue. Some people argue with me. So, oh no, she was a pure devotee. What are you saying? You know, you don't have a right to talk to her. You know, they'll, they'll go there right away. But she's a leader, right? Forget the fact that she shouldn't be a sannyasi. But that that whole thing is a deviation. But anyway, she was a leader. So it's up to her to uh, be aware of the situation and not not go into the mouth of the lion willingly. Okay. All glories to Sheila Prabhupada Ki Jai. And there's another example also. Like, for example, let's say someone wants, comes to the temple for the first time and says they want to join. Now, if the leader is not careful, right, uh, he, may let, he or she may let someone into the temple. It's dangerous. Like, for example, one time some man came and he wanted he told he wanted to see me. He sat down with me and he said, "I want to I want to live in a temple." I said, "Oh, that's that's good." I said, uh, "Tell me about yourself." He said, "Well, I'm initiated." I said, "Really? Okay. Who's your guru?" He gave me the name of the guru. And I said, "Okay. Uh, when where was you know? Tell me about your service. Uh, uh, how long did you serve with your guru? It's gurus." A little bit far away. He says, "Oh, I've, I've been I've been in the shave for uh, uh, ten years." I said, "Oh, I said, how many years have you been with your guru?" He said, uh, two. I said, "Oh, wonderful. What did you do the other eight years?" He said, "Well, I've been I've been around." I said, "Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> I've been around. Where have you been?" He said, "Well, I was in the, the state, uh, Colorado." I said, "Okay." But what were you doing? He said, well, I, I, was, I was doing service. I said, okay. Uh, was it in a temple? He said, no, it wasn't in a temple. I said, well, where was it? He said, well, it was in prison. I said, oh, okay. Why did you go to prison? Why, why were you sent to prison? I said, well, I did something wrong. I said, I know you did something wrong. Can you tell me specifically what you did wrong? So one thing leads to another. He finally says he raped his daughter. I said, oh, okay. I said, you can't stay in the temple. He said, why not? I'm a initiated demonic. I, I said, I know you are. But, you know, we have kids that come to this temple, and uh, we can't have a uh, person who's been uh, convicted of sexual pred predator uh, living in the temple. I said, you might want to come to the temple, but you can only come at times when there's no one here. He said, well, uh, is, is there any time like that? I said, eh, sometimes you would have to call me and you would have to be supervised when you're in the temple. Now, if I didn't ask all those questions, if I was, if I was oh, a new guy, you know, we get, you know, a warm body, you know, we, we need more devotees. Right? Now, where is he going to stay? He's going to stay in the temple, right? And he's going to live in the temple. So I can't let a person that I don't, I'm not absolutely sure about to live in the temple. Otherwise, I would be uh, irresponsible. And he's not going to sleep next to me, right? He's going to sleep next to brahmacharis. What if he's a homosexual or something like that, right? So, you know, all these things are important for leaders because, uh, you know, if you're going to let new people in and not really vet them, then let them sleep next to you. Why do they have to sleep next to brahmacharis? Why do they have to be in the temple when there are a lot of kids in the temple, right? We can't we can't take risks like that. It's too too risky. So Hari Bo. Srila Prabhupada ki it's every time like something uh, something happens in the news, all I found like really 
it, ma it makes me uh, more confident, uh, convinced about the nature of the material world and the spiritual world. You see the, the, the nonsense going on, you know, how people, they, they, I mean, the news is just a nonsense. It's just like you, you're witnessing the news nonsense going on. So nothing good in there. Well, I mean, we, we're, we, we're supposed to help people transform themselves from a, being a bad person to a good person, from being a nonsense to being a genuine devotee. But you can't jeopardize the lives of others during that process. You have to, you know, if you're going to have a program where you're going to take people off the street, then you have to have... Uh, a closed environment where they can't easy, they can't easily deviate. They have to be regimented, like military service, and you have to watch them 24 hours a day. You can't take your eyes off of them because you don't uh, unless you vet them very carefully. You could let in a, a predator because you know devotees are nice. They treat people nicely, you know. So predators they like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So unless you can vet the person and know where they were, what they were doing, you know, what foibles they have, what weaknesses they have, you know, you can't let them just come into the temple like that. Maybe we did that in the beginning, but, you know, we had a lot of problems because of that. So we shouldn't be so anxious to let a person until... I, I remember this one person who became a uh, guru in our movement, he came... First time to a temple where I was president, you know, and he wanted to join. I said, no, you can't. He said, what? So I came here to join. I said, no, better you go back to Germany and join there. He said, why is that? He said, well, I said, hey, you, you're German, so I think you would do better in Germany than here. And he got really upset, right? So he did go back to Germany. He did join, and later on, he became a guru in Iskand, right? So he's a sincere guy. And then, you know, every time he'd see me, he said, you remember you told me I couldn't stay in the temple? I said, yeah. He said, now I understand why. He said, because actually it was good for me to go back to Germany. <laughs> you want to join in France, yeah? Huh? You want to join in France? Yeah, yeah. And I told him, no, you go back to Germany and join. <laughs> he didn't like it, but... Uh, Later on, you know, we were we became very good friends, and uh, you know. When did you say that? Did you just spoke for you? I don't know. It's just I had a feeling that I had a feeling he would do better in Germany than in France. Ultimately, he achieved everything. He yeah, achieved yeah. He became a guru. Maybe in France he could have. Of course, he fell down also. Oh. <laughs> he's not a guru anymore, but he's a nice person. And he's a good mm -hmm. devotee. Yeah. I mean, he learned over time. You know. so these are different issues. Uh, to be a leader is not an easy thing. You know? And it's scary because I, I know someone who's a very good friend of mine. He was a guru. He was a GBC, everything. And he gave one person bad advice and that person died. And he, he gave up. He resigned. It was too much for him. See. Those type of things happen. So you have to be very, very careful. Haribo. Oh, there's a seal of progress.